Good evening. It is good to see this good number, and we're grateful for your presence this evening and hope that you will uh, study along with us this evening. We're going to look at another one of our question and answer lessons, and, and uh, excited about that. And here in just a minute, we're going to, at the conclusion of the lesson, offer the opportunity, as was mentioned by that good prayer worded by Brother Claytis a few minutes ago, to give you the opportunity to respond to the invitation of Christ, if that's your need. If you uh, uh, are someone who understands that Jesus is God's Son, who came to this earth to die for you and I, who uh, is one who wants to trust in Him and, and Him alone for salvation and live your life in service to Him, then you can confess your faith this night before this number and be immersed to have your sins washed away. If you're someone who is a child of God, who's done those things, but realize that you need to come back to Him, We'll give you the opportunity to do that if it's of a public nature. and We can pray with you and for you, then we will invite you to come. And that's an invitation that's open uh, all the time, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, uh, any time. Uh, it's not just at the times that we extend that invoca invitation at the end of uh, a lesson, but certainly we want to use that time to extend that invitation, and we'll do that in just a moment. You know, one of the things that is uh, difficult sometimes when you are trying to put together uh, questions and answers, uh, lessons such as this, is which direction to go next. And Romans 12 is the direction we're going to go tonight. If you have not already opened up your Bible to Romans 12, then I would invite you to do so. The book of Romans is a great book. It's one that is... Uh, uh, confounded some people at times, in part because we've uh, not done as good a job rightly dividing sometimes as maybe we should. But it's a, it's a wonderful book because the verse that Fred so well read for us a few moments ago is really the theme verse of the entire book, that the gospel is for all. And as I was looking through the, uh, the questions that's been submitted and Again, we would encourage you to submit any questions that you might have that you'd like us to look at in one of these question and answer lessons uh, at the uh, box in the back. There was a question in there that, as sometimes do, you know, there's some questions that just lead to more questions, right? Well, this question was one because the question was just Romans chapter 12, question mark. Now... I'm not trying to belittle anyone, you know, if you, whoever was submitted that may be in this room right now. And that's, it's hard to nail down exactly. So there's a question about Romans chapter 12. And I begin to look at the, the lesson itself, excuse me, at the chapter itself to try to ascertain what it was maybe that they were uh, uh, inquiring about. And uh, I found some things in there that I thought, you know, maybe it's this or maybe it's that. I begin to look at some uh, different books and writings that I have on the book of Romans to see maybe some passages that others have dealt with that maybe were troublesome. And, and there were a few that, but again, just hard to know exactly what, what it is exactly the, uh, the person who submitted that question is looking for. So what I decided to do this evening is just for us to look at Romans 12. And I will tell you that if you're in the audience tonight or you happen to be one who listens to this recording later on, if, if I don't cover exactly what you're asking about in Romans 12 or what you're wondering about, resubmit the question and be as specific as you want. Or you can obviously give very general questions and we'll try to cover that as well as we can too. But that's what we're going to do this evening is just look at Romans chapter 12, try to go through the, the, uh, the chapter and kind of figure out what's going on within it and see what we can uh, figure out from that. You know, the book of Romans is, again, a great book because the theme of it is the gospel is for all. And to kind of bring us up to date and give us an idea of the context of what's going on, you can basically break down the book into two major sections. Chapters 1 through 11 is the doctrinal section. That's the section where Paul is teaching them about the fact that the gospel is for all. And showing them what that means. And showing them uh, exactly what has been paid. And, and what it means for them. And what it means for the others. And what it means for their lives. And how they should be conducting themselves. And those type things. But when you get to chapter 12. It shifts a little bit. And he's still talking about how that the gospel is for all. But as he's been teaching them about that in the first 11 chapters. It's led to the last few chapters, chapters 12 through 16, which is the practical section, we're calling it. That is the section that, 
that we're, we're looking at to see how does that apply to my life? What do I do with this? There's, in every lesson, there should be the, there's the, the what, and then there's the so what, right? The what is the, here's the information. The so what is what do I do with that information, right? And, and in chapters 12 through 16, that's the so what section. That's the what do I do with this. So what are the practical implications of chapters 1 through 11. If all have sinned and we've all received justification. As he's talked about through the first 11 chapters of this book. Then that justification should serve to motivate us to faithful service. And we're going to talk about three areas. If you're following on your outline from the bulletin. Three different areas for tonight. That, that uh, service should be seen in. Romans chapter 12 teaches us that. Uh, and, and following chapters. Teaches us that because all uh, have been justified or have given been given the opportunity for justification through Christ, that it's all about our relationships that are able to be had because of Jesus. So the first lesson he teaches us about is our relationship with God. And there's a couple of things at least that we don't want to notice. Notice with me here, beginning in verse 1 of Romans chapter 12. He says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice... Holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. It's about our relationship with God. God is the one that sent Christ. God is the one that's made Himself manifest and known, as He talked about from the very beginning of this book in Romans chapter 1. To deny His existence is to deny the facts that are all around us. Understanding where we are as He shifts in chapter 1, going through chapter 2 and chapter 3, understanding that we're all sinners. And, and as such, we separated ourselves from God. We made it to where we could have no relationship with God. We allowed our sin to separate us. And then as He goes on to talk about the way that God has provided for us. A way that we could be justified, just as if I'd never sinned. Brought back into a right relationship with God. Then it means as we understand what God has done for us. The, the helpless situation we were in and what God has done for us. That we should be willing to live for Him. So he says, I beseech you, or I beg you, or I, I'm, I'm down on my hands and knees pleading with you. Because of everything that I've said before leading up to this, that you would live your life in a way that is sacrificial. See, this relationship with God requires a sacrifice. Because of sin, there's always been a sacrifice required, right? In the Old Testament, it was the sacrifice of, of the blood of bulls and goats. It wasn't impossible for those to take away our sins, the Hebrews writer tells us, but it did allow them... To continue to remember that, that sin has to have a penalty paid for it. And ultimately that penalty was paid through Jesus. So the perfect sacrifice has been made. Uh, this sacrifice of, of giving the life of something. Whether it was a lamb or a sheep or a dove or whatever it was. That was the penalty. That penalty was paid through Jesus. But God still expects a sacrifice. He expects a life to be given. But this sacrifice... That he expects now under the new and better covenant is not a sacrifice of death, but a sacrifice of life. We're to give a life, we're to give our own in faithful service to him. And that's what he talks about here. That, that giving ourselves to him, it's no longer I that lives, but he that lives in me. It's not what I want or what I desire. And so many times that's the way that we live our lives is, what feels good, what looks good, what's appealing to us. Now we're living for the Lord. And along with that comes a transformation. He says, not that you would be conformed to this world, but that you would be transformed. To conform means to fit the mold. To transform means to be turned into something completely different. You know, when we were growing up, we played with transformers. And because I think they've run out of ideas, they just keep recycling the movies and cartoons and whatnot. Now transformers are back out again. And the transformers are these made up creatures that come from another planet. They're robots 
that turn themselves into something completely. One minute it's a robot, the next minute it's a semi-truck. Something completely different. And that's what he's saying that we ought to be. When does that happen? Well, in Romans chapter 6, he told us when that would happen. When we're buried with him in baptism, that old man of sin is put to death and we're raised to walk in newness of life. So if we're raised to walk in newness of life, what he's saying is live a different life. People ought to be able to see a difference about us. We ought not look the way the rest of the world looks or act the way the rest of the world acts or, or entertain ourselves the way the rest of the world entertains or have the priorities that the rest of the world has. We're not being different just for different sake. And we're not saying that the more uh, odd that we might can be, that that, that makes us more holy or pure. But it's, it's a matter of what our priorities are. It's a matter of a relationship with God, of not wanting to fit in the same ruts. You know, the, the standard U.S. railroad gauge, that's the difference, uh, or the distance rather, between the rails. The standard gauge is four foot, eight and one half inches. That seems kind of odd, doesn't it? Why not just four foot, or five foot, or four and a half foot at least, right? Four foot, eight and a half inches. Well, the reason why it's that distance is because the railroad originally was laid by people who came from Europe, from England. And the standard in Europe and in England is, guess what? Four foot, eight and a half inches, rail to rail. That's the way they built it in, British, in Britain, and that's why they built it here, because that's what they had always done. They were locked into that gauge. And so the people who built tramways used the same standards and the same tools that they had used for building wagons. So wagons were set on a standard of four foot, eight and one and a half inches, wheel to wheel. Why were wagons set to that scale? Because any other size, the wheels didn't match the old wheel ruts in the road. And if they were wider or more narrow, you're either one wheel in a rut, one out, or, or you're constantly falling into it. So that's why they would be. Why were the wheel ruts that size? Well, you go all the way back until the first roads were built by Roman soldiers. The imperial Roman system for the benefit of the legions and the roads have been used ever since. And they were built originally for Roman war chariots. Guess how far apart Roman war chariot wheels were? Four foot, eight and a half inches. And because of that, we've continued to conform and stay in those same ruts all the way through the days of trains. See, we can stick to the same standard and wonder why grandma always cut the end off of the ham. Not because it was less important, but to fit it in the pot. That, that fitting the mold, staying in the same ruts that the rest of the world's been traveling in, that we were traveling in. Paul says, because you've been justified, you ought to live a different life, a transformed life. One that's built on your relationship with God. And that is the point that he wants him to understand. Here's those cobblestones for the Roman uh, chariots. Don't fit in those ruts, but be transformed. The second thing that he talks about in this chapter is not only our relationship with God has been changed because we've been justified, but our relationship with our brethren has been changed. Notice at beginning in verse 3, and you can go all the way on down nearly to the end of the chapter, when he's talking about all of these various things that need to be done, Various aspects of our relationship with our brethren. For example, he talks about that there should be some humility. Because if you'll notice beginning in verse 3 and going down to about verse 8, he talks about how that, you know, we're all part of the same body. Uh, there, there's different roles that have been given. There are, are different jobs that have been given. But we're all part of the same body of Christ. And the only reason that we're here... Is because God has placed us here. Because God has given us. Because God has done for us. We have, verse 6, gifts differing according to the grace that is given. We've got different roles and different jobs. 
But why should we think that one role is more important than another role? In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul's going to write to the brethren at Corinth and talk about this same thing in even greater detail. And he compares it to a physical human body. And how can the eye say to the... How can the hand say to the... What part of your body is less important than the other? Well, we can say that any might be until we lose it, right? So the idea of humility in our service, understanding that I'm, I'm a small part of a bigger picture here, has to be a part of our relationship with each other. And then he talks about the idea of working together. Because of that. And so he, he talks about how that, you know, as different members, we have different roles, different jobs, but we're going to work together for the same cause. And that's building up the church. That's building that relationship with God. That's reaching out to those who are outside the body of Christ and teaching them. And then he talks about doing good, beginning in verse uh, 9 and following. About all the different things that we should be doing. We should be doing good and, and not doing evil. And so back and forth he goes, we should be kindly affection. We should have brotherly love. We should be preferring one another. Not lagging in diligence. Being fervent in spirit. Serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope. Patient in tribulation. Continuing steadfastly into prayer. Steadfast, uh, distributing the needs of the saints. Giving hospitality. Blessing and rejoicing. Being of the same mind. Repaying no one evil for evil. Doing good, in other words, and not doing bad to each other. Now that seems very simplistic to say that, doesn't it? That part of our relationship with each other, what God expects for you and I, is for us to do good to each other and not do evil to each other. That's pretty simple, isn't it? What makes it hard sometimes is me. What makes it hard sometimes is we, not Him, us. Because we become self-focused. Because we become self-centered. Because we become very touchy. We become very uh, easily offended. Or we become very easily overlooked. Or we become lazy. You know, it's easier just to sit back and not try to build a relationship, isn't it? He says that we ought to work diligently, that we ought to do good and not evil to each other. We ought to be treating each other the way that brethren ought to treat each other. We ought to love each other. And that, that love is that agape love. He, he doesn't require us to phileo each other, to, to love each other like we're best friends. Now, we ought to grow to that. And Peter talks about how that we've been commanded to agape one another and we ought to grow to phileo each other. But that agape love is seeking the best interest in someone else, which means I'm always going to do good for you and never do evil towards you. And just imagine what the church would be if we would just follow that simple policy. Right? Do good to each other and don't do evil. Treat each other like family to love each other. The, the guy on the screen, I don't know if you can even uh, see those two men enough to recognize them. I don't know if you'd recognize them uh, even if you can see them very well. The man on the lawnmower is a man by the name of Alvin Strait. He's 73 years old and he lives in Lawrence, Iowa. His brother who is 80, lives in Blue River, Wisconsin. His brother in Wisconsin suffered a stroke. Now, the problem was, was that Alvin can't drive. He didn't see well enough to get a driver's license. Alvin has a great fear of riding an airplane or a bus or a train. So Alvin was in a predicament. He wanted... To get to his brother. Because his brother needed him. So he got on a lawnmower. That John Deere lawnmower on the screen. And he drove from Iowa. All the way to Wisconsin. On a 1966 John Deere tractor. Because his brother was in trouble. And he needed him. And when asked by reporters later. Why did you do it? You know what his answer was? I love him. That kind of love. 
is the brotherly love that Jesus prayed that we would have for each other. The kind of love that when we realize we've all been justified by Christ, that we all had no relationship until God showed His love through Jesus, until we rendered obedience to the gospel, until we were justified by Christ. And we love each other because of that relationship. Our relationship with God, our relationship with our brethren, and then he talks about our relationship with our enemies. If you notice what he says beginning in verse, uh, verse 17, he says, Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil but overcome evil with good. Our relationship with our enemies should change because of our being given justification through Christ. Notice what he says here. Number one, he says that we should never repay evil for evil. We should never repay evil for evil. They haven't treated me right, so I'm going to treat them wrong. They, they were mean to me, so I'm going to be mean to them. If that's coming from my six-year-old, that's one thing. But isn't that very juvenile in our thinking? Yet how many times do we act that way as adults? They're mean to me, so I'm going to be mean to them. And, and we're not talking again. We're, we're talking about people that are our enemies. That's what he's talking about. You know, we look outside the body of Christ. We look into the world. And sometimes people treat us badly, don't they? Now, we don't have the persecution here that uh, has been had in some places. It's currently had in some places. But sometimes people mistreat us still. Do we try to get even? He says, do not repay evil for evil. He talks about respecting what is right in their eyes. Having regard for the good things in the sight of others. In other words, looking and seeing the good things that they're doing. Understand, trying to see things from their perspective. You know, it could well be that that person that was mean to you, that wronged you in some way, did not know that they did that. Could, could it be that, that part of the problem is I haven't, I haven't tried to look and see from their perspective what's going on? And he says, try to be at peace with everyone. In fact, that's what he commands. As much as lies within you. Now, it's not possible to live at peace with all people, is it? But as much as it depends on me, I'm going to bend over backwards to make sure that there's peace, that there's harmony. He says, don't take your own revenge. That's God's job. That's not our job. Instead, he says to overcome evil with good. Is that possible? Well, you know, when you're dealing with and we start listing categories of people... Paul didn't say in certain circumstances, did he? Overcome evil with good. You know, you read church history back in the days of the first century and second century. And it's amazing how many Roman centurions were converted to Christianity. And you know the number one reason maybe that they were converted? They couldn't get over how Christians treated them while they were persecuting them. The faith that they had, the hope that they had, the love that they showed. Now someone says, what does this have to do with our being justified? Why should the fact that I've been justified in Christ, that the gospel is for all, why should that change the way that I treat my enemies? Because guess what I was in the sight of God when I chose sin, an enemy. And how did he treat me? He loved me and gave his son for me. See, because the gospel is for all, those enemies aren't just someone who are treating us badly. They're a soul. 
And if we're thinking souls, we're going to be thinking not how can I get back at them, but how can I get the gospel to them? That becomes our priority. The guy on the screen here is, is a man by the name of Edwin McMaster Stanton. Maybe you've uh, heard, if you're a history buff, of Stanton. Stanton was one of the most uh, outright enemies of Abraham Lincoln as he was running for president. He, he uh, really politicked as much against Abraham Lincoln as he did for himself or anything else. Had nothing good to say about Lincoln. Ran him down at every opportunity. And when Lincoln was elected president, as he's beginning to assemble his staff... He gets to the point where he's going to appoint his secretary of war. And guess who he chose to appoint as his secretary of war? Stanton. Everyone else in his staff said, you're making a mistake. Did you hear what all he said about you? Do you know how hard he worked against you? And Abraham Lincoln said, he's the right man for the job. And as the country was torn apart by war, it was Stanton that advised the president and helped him in so many ways. And when ultimately President Lincoln was assassinated, standing near Lincoln's coffin, one of the greatest things about our former president was said by Stanton. He said, quote, Lincoln was one of the greatest man, men who has ever lived, and he now belongs to the ages. You see, by treating him with respect, showing him love, not repaying evil with evil, but evil with good, he made a loyal friend out of someone who was an enemy. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 44, for us to love our enemies. Our relationship with God should change. Our relationship with our brethren should change. Our relationship with our enemies should change. And in Romans chapter 12 and verse 17, he's starting a, a section that's going to go into chapter 13 where he talks about how we should deal with the world. In light of the fact that the gospel is for all, this is the way that we should deal with the world. And then in chapter 14, going to nearly the end of the book until he finally gets to the closing remarks that he makes, and then in chapter 16, for the... the majority of chapter 14, 15, and 16, though, he's talking about how our relationship with each other should be affected. Chapter 13, for example, he talks about our relationship with government. He talks about our relationship with the world. And then in chapters 14 and 16, he talks about accepting each other's liberty with love and peace and unity. It's all about how that after I've taught you that the gospel is for all, how do you apply that? How should that affect your life? You see, sometimes when we hear the what, that's the biggest questions that we have. Is how do I apply this? Paul says the way we apply, Romans chapter 12, the way we apply the fact that the gospel is for all is it should change our relationship with God. It should change our relationship with our brethren. It should change our relationship with our enemies. All of that because Jesus changed our relationship and our hope for the future. The questions of Romans chapter 12 may or may not have been answered. But certainly the question of what should happen in our lives should be. There should be a change in the way that we view our relationship with God and others. Because that's really what Christianity is all about. It's about building those relationships. Strengthening our relationship with God and growing. Never being satisfied with where we are spiritually. But striving continuously. To grow closer to Him. It's about growing closer as a body in Christ. There's not a person outside of these walls that are ever going to want to be a part of this body if they don't see us loving each other and caring about each other and wanting to be with each other. And there's no way that we could possibly expect God to forgive us if we're not willing to forgive those who've wronged us. If we can't see them as souls and care enough about them to share the gospel of Christ with them. This evening, if you're subject to the invitation of Christ, it's our hope and prayer that if you have questions regarding your salvation, that tonight you, you make those things sure.
If we can help you in any way, if you're subject to the Lord's invitation in any way, if we can pray with you, if we can study with you, if we can help you in any way, come right now while we stand and while we sing.